Uh, this webinar builds on my early webinar last week on an introduction to intellectual property, where I covered the basics of what is a patent application, the criteria for patentability, that is novelty and inventive step, and what are search and examination reports. And if you haven't seen that webinar, uh, I'd urge you to have a look at that one also. So in this webinar, I want to talk about general processes for getting patents filed and granted around the world. If you have any questions, you can send them to me during the webinar using the Q&A buttons, and I'll try to deal with them at the end of my presentation. So this slide, here we go. This slide gives a summary of what I want to talk about today. The patenting process starts with the patent attorney who converts your invention into words in a patent application. And I will just recap on what is a patent application. Before you can consider filing your first patent applications, you need to determine who the inventors are and who the owners are, and that's vitally important. And I'll then talk about the various systems that there are for getting patents granted around the world. Now, I must stress that the patent system can be very complex. And for the purposes of this presentation, I've only included the very basic details. There are, however, exceptions to many of the features that I'll talk about, and there are exceptions to those exceptions. And if I were to include all of those exceptions in my presentation today, we'd be here to the middle of next week. And most of those exceptions are pretty boring anyway. So in this presentation, I've tried to cut through the maze and give you a simplified version. But whilst it's important for you to have an overview of the patent process, it's also important to know when to seek advice from your patent attorney if you have any specific questions. So the patenting process starts with you, the inventors, you do the hard bit, you have to make the invention. Although when I say make the invention, you don't have to have actually made a working example of your invention, but you must know enough about your invention in order to be able to put it into practice and to be able to describe how you could in fact make and work your invention. And certainly if your invention's in the pharmaceutical field, you need to have some data in your patent application to show that the invention does in fact work. It has a therapeutic effect. So the invention process starts with you, the inventors. You will then go to a patent attorney whose job it is to convert your invention into words, not diagrams, not pictures. We're not allowed to use those in the, in the patent claims. We have to put them in words. So quite often the inventor will come to me and says, right, I've invented these spherical bits of metal with little metal balls in them. They put them down on the desk and say, right, I want a patent application for that. So it's a job of the patent attorney to convert the features of that invention into words. And if you think of something, even a simple thing, like a, like a paper clip, I mean, if you were the first person to invent the paper clip, how would you describe that in words? If you imagine you are on, the, on your mobile phone to somebody in a, in a different country and say, and you were saying to them, I've invented this little bit of metal that can be used to attach bits of paper together. How would you describe to them a paper clip in words? And that just illustrates the, the, the sort of the, the job that the patent attorney has to do in order to convert a, a, a possibly a complex invention um, that you've made and you're an expert in into words in the patent application. But I say that is the job of the patent attorney. The patent attorney produces a patent application. What is a patent application? A good patent application is simply a, a 10, 12, 13, 14, 20, 100 page book on your invention. And all patent applications have pretty much the same sort of format. When they're published, they will have on the outside of the patent application, they will have details of who the inventors are, who the applicants are, the date that the patent application was filed, and quite often an abstract and some figures illustrating the invention. Inside the patent application, there will be details of the background to the invention in order to educate the patent office examiner about what's happened previously, and then details of of the features of your invention, some examples of those features, which ones are most preferred, those explicit um, descriptions of and definitions of your invention. There'll be some examples of how to put the invention into practice, because as I said a minute ago, it's, it is important that you know how to put the invention into practice because you're not gonna get a patent for uh, an invention which you cannot actually, actually, you could not actually make yourselves. At the end of the patent application, there are quite often some drawings, some figures, um, to show some examples of your invention or to show some data to show that it works. But the most important part of the patent application and the most difficult part to, for the patent attorney to, to create are the claims of the patent application that describe explicitly in words exactly what your invention is. So we've made the invention, we've got a patent application, where do we go from there? 
First of all, before we start thinking about where you want to file your patent applications around the world, you need to remember what rights the actual the grant of a patent will actually give you. Remember, first of all, that the patent is a negative right. It gives you the right to stop others doing various acts in, in the countries where you've got patents. In particular, it gives you the right to stop your, your competitors making or selling or using your invention or importing it into those countries. So with that in mind, you need to think where might you want to file patent applications around the world. So patents are territorial rights. So if you want protection in the patent protection in the United States, you're going to need an American patent. You want patent protection in Japan, you're going to need a Japanese patent. So generally, one patent covers one country, although we'll, we'll talk about the European system a bit later. So bearing in mind the rights that the patent will actually give you, the right to stop people selling your invention, um, what countries do you want to stop people doing that? What, what countries do you want to stop your competitors doing that? So if your competitors are likely mainly to be selling your invention in the United States, then you need an Amer American patent. And in most cases, um, America is always going to be a big market. Europe is likely to be a very big market as well. So once you've got those two countries, that probably covers 60, 70% of your market. What other countries might you want to cover as well? Secondly, you need to think where are your competitors is likely to make your invention? Are they likely to be competitors in China or India that might want to make your invention in their manufacturing plants there and then import it into your other markets? So you, want to get, you might want to get Chinese and Indian patents in order to stop your competitors actually manufacturing it in those particular countries. Finally, I'll talk about the priority system in just a second, but there is a, this, this system that means you don't have to file all your patent applications in all your different countries around the world all at once which is a very useful system to have. But before we talk about further about geographically where you want to file your patent applications and how to do that, we need to think about a few other things. First of all, who are the inventors on your invention? Now, I deal with a lot of clients who are academics and researchers, and they're very familiar with filing scientific publications around the world. And in these publications, um, there'll be a number of authors, mostly, I mean, you might name the main researcher, the postdoc, the PhD student, the head of the department, the lab technician, the cleaner, anybody who's had any involvement in the invention or, or the research, um, you will probably qu you quite often want to name those in order to acknowledge the input that they've had on this. But as far as the patent system is concerned, the inventors must only be those people who've actually made some clever bit, some inventive contribution to the invention. So it might not be the PhD student because the PhD student was only doing exactly what their, their supervisor told them. It might not be the head of the lab because they in fact didn't have any direct input in this particular invention. So in this particular case, whereas there were eight different authors on the scientific publication, the corresponding patent application, which obviously was filed before the, 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 the publication, um, the corresponding patent application only named three of the eight authors. It only named the, the, the PhD, PhD student, the, the supervisor, and the postdoc. Yet the head of the lab didn't have any direct input and was not named. And the, and the, other, five, the other four people were not named as well. So it is vitally important to make a distinction, as I said here, between authors on scientific papers and patent inventors because they are not necessarily the same thing. And so you must look rigorously at who made all the different aspects of the invention um, and the, the people who made inventive contributions should be named, but other people who didn't make inventive contributions, they must not be named. So the inventors will always be the first owners of the invention. So once you've established who the inventors are, you then need to think, well, have they still got their rights in the invention or have their rights legally passed to any other party? For example, in, in the case here, the we've got three different inventors here. The first inventor is, a, is employed by Oxford University. Now, under that contract of employment, any inventions that are made using university resources um, in, in university time will automatically go to the university. So the first inventor no longer has rights an inventor. They, her rights are owned by the university. The second inventor was a PhD student, but her research was being sponsored by Cancer Research UK, and under that contract of sponsorship, her rights have gone to Cancer Research UK. 
Similarly, the third inventor was, was being sponsored by Glaxo and under the contract with Glaxo, her rights have gone to Glaxo. So in fact, in this case, none of the three inventors still have their rights. They've all been passed to third parties and hence it is the combination of Oxford University, Cancer Research UK and Glaxo that actually own the invention and so they should be the applicants for the patent application. And so the point I want to raise here is that simply because you're an inventor doesn't mean that you can automatically file a patent application in your own name and reap the benefits of any rewards you get at the end of the day. You have to look rigorously at who the inventors are and then rigorously at where all the rights of the inventors have gone because they might not necessarily stay with the inventors um, and you need to establish carefully who the applicants for the patent need to be. So you still can't decide yet where you want to file. There's another thing that you need to look at before you can do that. Now, there's a, in most countries around the world, there are patent laws that say that, that, that restrict the right that, sorry, that restrict where the inventors can file their first patent applications. Now, a lot of these laws relate to um, issues of national security or public safety. Um, for example, if you're an American and you've made a new nuclear bomb invention, uh, the Amer under American patent law, you have to file that first in the United States. They don't let you file it first in, in Russia, for example, for obvious reasons. So, once you've established who the inventors are, we then have to look very carefully at the nationality or the residency of those inventors to see whether they are allowed to file the patent applications uh, in any particular countries. For example, if you are a Greek national, then all of your inventions must be filed in first patent applications at the Greek Patent Office. Under UK law, if you are a resident in the UK and your invention relates to national security or public safety, then you must file your first patent application for an invention at the UK Patent Office. And as I said a minute ago, if your invention is made in the United States or one of the inventors was made part of the invention in the United States, then your patent application, then your first patent application must be filed at the United States Patent Office. And there are penalties, quite severe penalties, if you don't, um, don't uh, follow these principles. For example, there are fines and imprisonment for either the inventors or even the patent attorneys if they assisted in filing these patent applications in countries where they were not allowed to. So it's vitally important to establish who the inventors are and that decides you know, which countries you, you might have to or which uh, to file your first patent applications. So once you've overcome that, um, you can then think about whether, where to file in patent applications where to file in countries around the world. So this slide gives a, a sort of summary of the, of the basic process. Um, your first patent application will be called a priority application, and I'll talk a bit more about that in just a second. Quite often that's filed in your home country. Within 12 months of that, you then have to decide which other countries around the world you want to file patent applications. And then at that 12 month period, you will then basically take your patent application file it at the different patent offices, for example, United States, American, uh, Canadian patent offices. And then the patent examiners in each of those countries will examine your patent applications essentially independently. They will be applying the, the, the same novelty and inventive step rules, um, but slight variations from country to country. Um, and the other sort of criteria, you know, have you got enough information in your patent application? Are your patent claims clear enough? And they will examine each of those criteria independently in the countries, and then hopefully you'll get patents granted at the end of the day. So that's the, the basic principle, but I'll talk about some of the variations in just a second. First of all, this priority year. So as I said, you can file a first patent application in quite often in your home country, once you've checked who the inventors are. Your first patent application is called a priority application, um, apart from the United States where it's called a provisional application. But basically provisional applications, priority applications, they're all the same thing. And the date that you file your priority application is called the priority date. Now, once you file that, then it's only things in the public domain before that date that could be citable against the novelty or inventive step of your invention. So it's quite important to get a, an early priority date um, to make sure that there's the, the minimum amount of public domain information citable against your invention. So you file your first patent application, the patent attorney is written, and you have 12 months to, in order to decide what you want, where you want to file other patent applications. Now, 
This 12 month period has a number of advantages because it allows you to do a number of things. First of all, in the UK at least, if you file your patent application at the UK Patent Office, you can request a search and examination if you want from a, from a UK Patent Office examiner. So within this 12 month period, you can get a search report and examination report from the Patent Office, which says, yeah, which judges, yeah, are you like, are, you invent, are your claims novel? Are they inventive? And so you get a good early indication from the Patent Office in the UK as to whether you're likely to get patents granted in other countries. Now, if the Patent Office examiner comes back and says, no, all features of this invention lack novelty or inventive step, there's no chance you're going to get patent applications granted in other countries, then you can just give up there. Hopefully that's not what they say. Within this year, it gives you a chance to produce more data on your invention and you can add that data into your priority application. And the way that you do that is literally sort of take your text of your first priority application, slip in another example or a new sort of few more paragraphs and then refile that updated priority application. I've called them P2 or P3 here. Um, and that will give you a further priority date, but you can use that to sort of add further information into your patent application. If you're not very familiar with your market of your invention yet, um, it gives you a chance to do a market survey to see whether there is in fact yeah, people out there who are likely to pay for your invention at the end of the day. And if you are a lone investor or a small company, it gives you a chance to approach investors uh, in order to, to, to pay for your further development of your invention. And a patent application is a really good legal document which concisely defines what your invention is and it's going to be stamped with your priority date as well. So it's a very good document to be able to take to investors uh, or either to other, other companies as well because it just defines succinctly what your invention is and the date that you filed it in. Now, I said at the end of the priority year, you then ha can have to decide what other country patent applications you want to file. Now, if, the, if your invention is at the same at the priority date, at the, sorry, if, you, if you've got the same invention at your priority date and at the end of the priority year, if you haven't changed the claims, uh, the patent claims route, then any further patent applications you file will take your priority date. But if you change the claims, during the course of the year, then you might in fact lose your priority date. Now, and so it is, it is vitally important to sort of bear this point in mind if you do make sort of further developments of your invention during the year, or if you publish details of invention during the course of the year. For example, if your priority application, say you were the first person to, to invent a car, and then you thought during the course of the priority year, well, six wheel cars are really good. And so your later patent applications had claims to both cars and to six wheel cars. Because your priority application referred to cars, then your priority date is, is valid. But if your, but because your priority application only referred to cars and not six wheel cars, then your priority date would not be valid for six wheel cars. And so it's vitally important to point to sort of remember. I hope that I've explained that sufficiently because it can be get quite a complicated point. So bearing that point in mind, you filed your priority application. At the end of the 12 month period, you then have to decide um, which patent applications to file. Um, and as I said, you can amend the, the patent application, your priority application during the course of the priority year. But at the 12 month period, your patent application then essentially becomes closed. You're not allowed to add any further details into it. And so then that that complete text of the patent application with any further information that you've added at the 12 month period will form the text that you file in any other countries around the world. So I said, you're not allowed to add any further information into it, but within, within reason, you're, you're allowed to sort of mix and match the sort of various features with, within it. And you might want to import features from the description that aren't into the claims, for example. Um, so you filed your individual country patent applications, they will be searched and examined by those individual country uh, patent office examiners, and each of your patent applications will be published at the 18 month stage. Um, so this, remember this is, so it will be published well before you're likely to get patents granted, but that is part of the quid pro, quid pro quo of the patent system. In order for a, a possible monopoly right on your invention in a particular country, you put all details of your invention into the public domain. Uh, and it's always a risk because you, you, you don't know whether you're going to get patents granted at the end of the day.
But that's the, that, so that's the basic system. So priority applications, individual country pattern applications, individually searched and examined, and individually granted. But there's a couple of variations of that which are important for you to know. First of all, European patent system. There is a centralized system within Europe where you can file one European patent application after filing a priority application if you wish, and this will be centrally searched and examined um, by the patent office examiners. Most of the patent office examiners are either based in Munich in Germany or in The Hague, um, and they will be, yeah, they will be centrally searched, published and examined uh, by those examiners. And then at the end of that examination process, a European patent will be granted. But at the moment, there is no such thing as a pat European patent that covers the whole of Europe. Now, under this system, which is not an EU system, and so there are up to 44 countries into it, not all EU countries, um, sorry, uh, not all the countries are, are EU countries. For example, Switzerland is, is, is within this system. But when you get to the grant stage, you then have to take a decision of which of those 44 countries you want to validate your European patent. So, and in order to bring the, 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 the patent into force into the, in those individual countries, you, you basically have to sort of file a copy of the, of the patent uh, in those countries, but there's no further examination within that system. Um, but I say that there is no patent that covers the whole of Europe. And so when, once the patent is granted, it, it is then fragmented into a number of individual country patents. So for example, you, you bring your patent in, your European patent into force in the UK. If you find a competitor in the UK, you have to sue him for infringement in the UK courts. Similarly, if there's a competitor in the, you find in Germany, you have to sue the patent, sue the competitor in the German courts. And so, and so that is the current system that's been working since the 1970s, uh, and it works very well. But since that time, the, the, the goal, particularly of the European Union, is to have one unitary patent that covers the whole of Europe. And this has been talked about since the 1970s. And finally, a couple of years ago, they managed to get agreement. There was a lot of discussion, yeah, particularly about the languages that this might work in, but those issues were resolved a couple of years ago. And we're, we're just about to sort of bring in, hopefully, a, a new unitary patent. But as I say, this hasn't started yet. Now, to come into force, this patent system has to be ratified, has to be signed by at least the three main European patent filing countries within Europe, which are France, Germany and the UK. Now, France has signed it. Uh, the UK, to their credit, has also signed it. Theresa May's government a couple of years ago signed it in order to help it bring it into force. But at the moment, it's stuck in the German courts because there's been a challenge to the validity of this system in the German courts and we don't know when that, that challenge is going to be heard. Um, so we don't know at the moment whether the, the challenge is going to be uh, upheld, for, and, th and then in that case, that the system might not come into to being at all. Um, furthermore, Boris Johnson's government in, in March of this year said that the UK actually was not going to take part in this system. Now, the UK has been a, a key player in the system up till now. They've been the main writer of the rules. They're supplying a lot of the new judges that might be required for, the, for this sort of system. And so without the UK's participation, the whole system might just fall apart. So at the moment, we don't know whether it's going to come into force. We don't know when it's going to come into force, if, if ever it will. Um, but if it doesn't come into force, then the old European patent system, which will still run in parallel anyway with this system, uh, the old system will still keep going anyway. And if the UK isn't part of this system, then you can still get European patents under the old system anyway. So as far as this system is concerned, it's a case of watch this space. Finally, I want to talk about the international patent system because this is because at least uh, about half of all patent applications that are filed around the world go through this system. Um, so this system is an international patent system and under an international treaty called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT Treaty, uh, and at least about 150 countries around the world, all the major players have signed up to this system. Now, like all the other systems, it starts off with the priority application, uh, but at the 12 month stage, you don't file directly in the countries, you file your international patent application. And you can designate in these international in this international patent application yeah, up to 150 countries. And yeah, they're, they're pretty much automatically designated. You don't have to list them at that time. 
So during the international phase, you will get a search and examination of your patent, off, patent application. Um, and certainly for UK priority applications, the search and examination is done by the European Patent Office, yeah, a well-respected patent office. And so you get a, a, say, an early indication of whether you're likely to get patents in, in other countries granted. It will also be published at the 18 month stage. A lot of you will be familiar with WO publications. Those are the pat patent publications, international patent publications. But there is no grant stage at the international fa phase. There is no such thing as an international patent. So if somebody says to you, I've got an international patent for my invention, they don't know what they're talking about. So, but at the 30 month stage, you then have to take a decision, and that's a narrow window between 30 and 31 months. Um, you have to make a decision on which individual country patent applications that you want to file. So at that 30 month stage, you would take your, your complete text of your patent application, you would file it in the individual countries, which could include Europe, United States, Australia, Canada. You would file it at those individual country patent offices, and then the patent office examiners of each of those countries would then examine it in the normal way as if they were individual country patent applications, and hopefully you would get patents granted at the end of the day. So what are the advantages of this international system that makes it so popular? Well, first of all, it, it puts off the big costs. The main costs of filing patent applications occur when you file individual, in individual countries. So because for each of the individual countries, you're going to have to pay the, the patent attorney fees in those countries, you're going to have to pay the patent office fees in those countries, and you're going to have to pay your patent attorney fees for coordinating filing in around the world. And so, so the 30 month stage is the important um, expensive stage. And so if you can put that off for 30 months, two and a half years from your priority application, then it puts off for you a lot of the costs. And by that time, you've had a, a good search and examination report that's done by um, the international examiners, often at the EPO. Um, so you know whether you're likely to get patents granted and of what sort of scope in individual countries. And so this fact that, yeah, that you get a, an international search and examination report and you can put off the big costs, make it a very popular system, particularly for small and medium sized enterprises or, or universities, because it gives them up to two and a half years to, to find investors uh, to take the, the patent applications forward and the investors to, to pay for the cost of filing the national phase patent applications. Um, and obviously, the more national phase patent applications, the more countries that you file in, the more your costs are going to be. So because of that, uh, the advantages of the system, it makes it very popular, particularly in, for, for technologies in the pharmaceutical field. For example, if your invention relates to a new drug, it's likely that it's going to be sort of 10, 15 years before you've got marketing authorization to put that drug on the market anyway. So the fact that it takes two and a half years to, to get to the national phase is not a problem. However, if you're working in a more rapidly developing technology, for example, mobile phone technology, you might not want to use this system. You might want to file your patent applications yeah, right in the first month, all the way around the world. You don't have to use the priority system if you don't want to. Um, and you can use a mix and match. You can use a priority application system and the international system for some countries. Um, other countries you might want to file directly in order to get the patents granted in those countries a lot earlier because you, you can't start enforcing your patents until you get them granted in the countries. And so you can mix and match the various different options. So that pretty much concludes what I want to say for today, just um, to hammer home the sort of take home messages here. Um, it is vitally important yet yeah, to work out who the inventors are and the owners are. I can't stress that enough, uh, importantly enough. You, and you do have to do that very rigorously. Yeah, be aware of the different systems. Hopefully you've learned about the different the priority systems and the international systems, European systems today. And as I say, you can mix and match of those to um, make the most economical use of, 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 of your, your resources uh, and, and take advice from your patent attorney on how best to do that. Um, so those are the, the, the various different ways of getting patents filed around the world. I haven't talked much today about the, the ways of getting them granted in cert, terms of search and examination reports. I talked about a bit of those uh, last time. And in fact, we've got a podcast in the next couple of weeks that we'll be discussing a bit more about how to get patents granted. Um, that's our IP podcast um, that's, that's coming out sort of shortly in the next couple of weeks. 
Um, I'll be back in a couple of weeks time. I've got another seminar. I'm going to be talking about freedom to operate. So that is talking not about your patents, but worrying about other people's patents um, and how you can find out about them and what you can do about them. And I'll also have a further presentation on the patenting in the medical and biotech field because that's one of my particular specialities. So I will leave that there. Um, I think we have some questions. Um, I can't see them immediately come up yet. Let me see if I can sort of pull down some of the, the Q&As that we've got. Um, uh, let's see if I can kill that again without going back. Can't see any immediate questions at the moment. So in that case, yeah, if you have got any specific questions on, on any of these particular topics, I know issues to do within the priority year can be, can be a bit more complicated. Oh, I'm just saying, oh, not a question. Thanks very much for the seminar, very useful. Thank you very much to Christos. Um, yeah, issues in the priority year can be very complicated, particularly whether you file priority applications and then you publish your invention and then file further patent applications. Yeah, do be very careful, particularly in those. Yeah, do seek particular advice from your patent attorney on those sort of issues. Right, with that, I will hand back to uh, Michelle, who is going to say, gives us some final words on the next seminars that we've got coming up. Yes, um, thanks, Phil. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle, the Business Development Manager at Danes. Thanks for attending today's seminar. Thanks, Phil, for presenting. If any questions do occur to you, do just let us know and we'll answer them in, the, um, in our follow-up email. If you missed Phil's webinar last week, which was an in introduction to the patent system, you can find the recording of it on our website in the Inspired Thinking section. In the same section, you'll find our newly launched podcast series, the IP Podcast. These are 15-minute episodes and they take a look at various aspects of IP. And as Phil mentioned, the latest episode, which came out today, also talks about the patent filing process. So if you'd like a review of some of the content we covered today, do take a listen. We've got a number of webinars scheduled for June, July, and August, so please keep checking back on what we've got lined up or subscribe for updates using the link in our follow-up email. Next week's webinar on supplementary protection certificates, which extend the life of a drug patent, is, is for our more specialized IP practitioners, but the following webinar on patenting software is very much geared towards today's audience, so do register for that one if it's of interest. That's it for today. So thank you very much. And we hope to welcome you all to another Danes webinar very soon. Thanks, Phil. And take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.